The summer of 98 is still a memory as crisp as yesterday, despite the edges of time having started to gnaw at its clarity. I can remember it with an acute vividness. It was a time when everything seemed simple. When Mark, Tom, and I embarked on an adventure that was to end in horror. For the previous four years, we had gone camping at the same spot and had no reason to change what was becoming a tradition. The remote forest, encircled by rugged mountains and kissed by glittering streams, welcomed us as always with an embrace of refreshing chill. It was a marked contrast to the sweltering city. We had been planning this trip for months, relishing the peace of the outdoors and the camaraderie that we shared. Mark, with his never-fading enthusiasm, had a knack for convincing us to tag along, and Tom was always up for an adventure. The first day had a setting of camp, the merry chaos of pitching tents and fumbling over the intricacies of campfire cooking filling our hours. Laughter rang loud, echoing through the ancient trees that had seen more summers than we could count. Mark, as always, was the life of the party, his stories taller than the forest's tallest trees. And Tom was reserved yet humorous. He always added a quiet charm to our trio. Everything was going the way it always did, and the trip seemed to be destined to become yet another wonderful memory. The first day was a blast, and it ended much too soon. The following morning, we were up before the break of dawn. The air smelled of pine and fresh earth, whispering tales of the world we were about to explore. The hike had become part of our tradition, with us taking the same path each time. But this year, Mark had suggested a different path. And we had all agreed that this slight change might be a good thing. The trail we would be heading down was one Mark had noticed on a past trip. In the year between then and now, he had scoured maps, finally finding it on one from the 1950s and on two from the 1940s. The trail had disappeared from all maps from the 1960s on and its overgrown nature attested to it having been abandoned. However, since it was still noticeable and distinctly a trail, it seemed that it had remained in use even after it had been removed from the maps. This slight mystery was part of the reason we had decided that it would be a fun trail to go down. So after breakfast, we set out down the trail. We had been going for about an hour when we came upon the remains of a fence. The fence stretched away to either side of the trail, disappearing into the forest. A broken, rusty gate that had apparently once barred the trail lay to the side. The fence had been substantial once, nine feet tall with barbed wire. We had gone a couple of miles past the fence when we reached a clearing. The trail seemed to end here. That's odd, Mark said. The map shows the trail going further. He pulled the map from his backpack and began trying to decipher it. Tom wandered deeper into the clearing and suddenly tripped over something. We headed over to him. As he recovered, we discovered an oddly symmetrical hole ringed by a steel frame almost hidden under layers of dirt and rust. Recessed in the ring was a rusty metal hatch. It looks like some sort of door, Tom remarked, his voice laced with curiosity as he dusted his trousers. Mark was already on his knees, poking the earth around the hole with a stick. The clearing, once filled with the bright chatter of birds and rustling leaves, fell oddly silent as we focused on this enigma. What do you think it is, James? Mark asked me, his eyebrows raised in anticipation. He was an adrenaline junkie, always seeking out new adventures. My initial thought was that it might be an old well, but the circular metal door suggested otherwise. It could be some old bunker or something, 
I suggested, my imagination already beginning to populate with scenes from Cold War movies. A bunker in the middle of the forest? Tom echoed, skepticism etched across his face. I shrugged in response, equally puzzled. Mark was already pulling at the corroded hatch, grunting with effort. With a sudden clatter that echoed through the silent woods, the hatch swung open, revealing a set of old metal stairs descending into the gloom. In that moment, something in the forest changed. The wind itself seemed to hold its breath, the silence growing deeper as if the trees themselves were waiting in anticipation. The gaping hole felt as ominous as it was exciting. While Tom and I were still absorbing the find and trying to figure out what it was, Mark had already dropped down into the hole and was descending the stairs. Hey, there's another hatch here, he called up. Tom and I looked at each other, then we ventured inside, ignoring the primal part of our brains that screamed to stay in the safety of the familiar. When we reached the hatch, Mark was already trying to open it. Are you sure we should do this? I asked. I mean, it's a bunker in the woods. We don't know what it's for, why it's here. Exactly. We don't know what it's for. It's a mystery, and it's clearly abandoned. I mean, look at the rust. And remember the fence? Mark said, All we're gonna do is a little Herb X. (laughs) Or Arboreal X in this case. Tom and I once again looked at each other. Tom started to speak, but was stopped by the groaning of the rusty door being opened. Mark headed in instantly. I sighed. Screw it, whatever. Then I headed inside. Tom followed. As we ventured in, the air in the bunker was stale, carrying a hint of damp earth and metallic rust. The weak sunlight from the entrance barely penetrated the darkness, our flashlights bouncing off the concrete walls, bringing a subterranean world into focus. In the depths of the concrete bunker, The resounding echoes of our own footsteps clawed their way through the corridors, as if the walls themselves whispered a foreboding warning. Drips of water like the rhythmic beating of a heart echoed with haunting persistence. Skittering mice, their tiny claws scratching against the desolate floors, added to the symphony of eerie sounds that permeated the aging facility. Each shadow cast a sinister veil, concealing secrets that begged to be unveiled. But those whispers, faint as ghostly breaths, were too elusive to grasp, leaving only a sense of disquiet that seeped into our very souls. The musty scent of age-old concrete filled our nostrils as we delved deeper into the bunker, our flashlights cutting through the pitch black revealing a labyrinth of corridors and abandoned rooms. Guys, are you sure about this? Tom said, casting a cautious look at us. There was apprehension in his eyes, but also a tinge of excitement. Mark laughed, a tad too nervously, perhaps. What could possibly go wrong? He said, taking the lead. His words bounced off the concrete walls, echoing back at us with an eerie resonance. He paused before the aged doors, rust encrusting its hinges. It creaked open under his touch, revealing a vast room littered with derelict equipment, dusty file cabinets, and decaying papers. I stepped inside. Our flashlight beams swept over the room, bouncing off the stark white walls now discolored with age and dampness. I caught sight of a handful of photographs strewn on a dusty desk, their edges curled with time. I picked up one, blowing off the dust. The image was faded, but showed a group of serious-looking individuals in lab coats, posing proudly before a complex piece of machinery. Hey guys, check this out! 
I held up the photograph. Tom and Mark huddled closer, their eyes widening at the sight. It was our first tangible link to the bunker's enigmatic past. We split up then, combing through the room, searching for clues that might shed light on the bunker's history. Tom found a series of logbooks, their pages brittle with age. Mark discovered a reel-to-reel tape recorder encased in a layer of dust and a pile of reels of tape stacked beside it. Our excitement bubbled as we realized the potential treasure trove of information that we had uncovered. We gathered around the recorder. Mark pressed the play button on the machine, and the taut silence was broken by the click and hum of the recorder. Gears within it whirled, and the first tape began its hypnotic spin, winding back the decades as it spun its tail. The room was suddenly saturated with the spectral voice of a man that seeped through the persistent veil of static. His voice was chillingly impersonal, revealing an underlying thread of detached academia. He was a scientist, that much was clear. His vocal cadence methodical and steady as he delved into the meticulous minutia of his groundbreaking research. The narrative wove together, strand by strand. A picture of their work involving human subjects that made the hairs on our neck stand on end. His descriptions were devoid of any emotional content and his tone was flat. The result of years of immersion in empirical reasoning and disciplined methodology. Yet his sterile narrative style was precisely what made the content all the more unnerving. There was a chilling contrast between the cold clinical language he used and the horrifying implications of what they were doing, which made it all the more real and menacing. As the tape continued to play, an eerie portrait of science gone dreadfully wrong began to manifest before our mind's eyes. Every meticulous detail, every observation he shared, sent tremors of dread coursing through our bodies. The scientist spoke of experiments intended to push the boundaries of human potential, which had instead lurched monstrously off track. His voice betrayed the faintest tremor as he detailed the unexpected and terrifying outcome. The human test subjects had all morphed into grotesque forms that seemed to flout the laws of nature. The scientist described the transformations in such unyielding detail that the images were inescapable. There were depictions of limbs elongating, eyes multiplying, skin hardening into armored plating. He reported displays of physical prowess that defied any rational explanation, like the ability to pass through solid walls or bend light around their forms, becoming practically invisible. Those were the nice transformations. Others were... Well, I won't recount them here. As he related them, we all felt our stomachs knot and twist as we listened. A palpable sense of fear permeated the silence following the recordings. The enormity of what we had unearthed was slowly sinking in. Our enthusiasm had given way to dread. Our senses now acutely aware of our surroundings. Tom broke the silence. This... This can't be real, can it? Mark was unusually silent. His face was pale in the dim flashlight beam. I shared his sentiment. The weight of the truth, as horrifying as it was, began to seep into our bones. And then it happened. A sound, or rather an echo of a sound too distant to pinpoint, yet too close for comfort. A shuffling, a grating, an unexplainable noise bounced off the concrete walls. 
winding its way through the labyrinthine bunker, bringing with it an indisputable reality. We were not in here alone. It must be rats, Mark said as he headed further into the facility. For some reason, the distress and discomfort he had had just moments before disappeared with the sound. Tom sighed and followed him, used to his cousin's recklessness. I stared down at the tape machine and the photo in my hand. Come on, man, Mark yelled back to me. It's just a big joke, that's all. Forget about it. It's not real. Those are just rats. Well, it certainly seemed real, and those noises... They didn't sound like rats, but against my better judgment, I followed my friends. Over the next few minutes, we moved deeper into the maze that was the facility, the decay and stagnation of the past clinging to the air around us. The once sterilized world of white walls and steel equipment was now a crypt. It's a freaking time capsule. Tom remarked, sifting through a stack of papers on a desk. His voice echoed off the cold concrete, adding a certain chill to the already unnerving atmosphere. His fingers ghosted over pages filled with faded ink, charts and equations that neither of us could comprehend. Meanwhile, Mark was fixated on more of the seemingly omnipresent ancient recording equipment. He had continued to play with each of them we encountered, but only that first one had worked. This time, though, the machine came to life, projecting a whispering voice. It was grainy, distorted by time, but its message was crystal clear. It was the voice of a man, the scientist from the recording we had found earlier. He began detailing the chilling progression of their experiments, He spoke again of breakthroughs and anomalies, and then of horror and desperation. There was more emotion this time, but there was still something about the detached way he described the subjects, a human beings, reduced to guinea pigs that turned my stomach. We must have been mad, the voice on the tape said a tremor in his usual steady tone. What we have created here is an abomination. Mark reached over and turned off the machine, the tape spinning to a halt. Silence permeated the room for a moment, the residual traces of the revelations clinging to our skin. What was this place? Tom breathed out, running a hand over his face. The narratives shared by the voice from the past painted a picture more gruesome than any of us had ever imagined. The bunker, this abandoned relic, was the birthplace of monstrous creations, products of ambition and hubris. Should should we go? Tom asked, his eyes wide in the torchlight. Yeah, I think we should, I said. Guys, it's got to be a joke. Someone was here before us and left these to freak out anyone else who happened to find the place. Just a little (laughs) arboreal ex humor. You know, Mark said. Okay, maybe, Tom said, but he didn't seem to completely buy it. Yeah, maybe, I said. But we should still go. I've got a bad feeling about this place. Yeah, let's go, Tom said. Guys, come on, Mark said in disbelief. The curiosity that had brought us to this godforsaken place was slowly morphing into dread. The walls seemed to close in on me, and a sense of unease started creeping up my spine. I couldn't shake off the feeling that we were not alone. There was a presence, something that lurked just out of sight in the deeper recesses of the facility. A chill spread through me as once again an unidentifiable noise echoed down the corridors. 
the muted echo of a metallic scrape against the concrete floor. This time, it seemed closer. We headed back into the main corridor, and I started back the way we had entered. I had reached the doors that led out of this area and was about to head through when I heard Tom call out, Mark, what are you doing? We're leaving. I glanced back and saw Mark had gone down a side hall. Relax, it's fine. All of that was years ago. Let's just explore a little more. Tom looked at me with a look of disbelief. Then he headed down the hall after Mark. I paused, unsure of what to do. It was clear to me that we needed to leave, but splitting up was stupid. So, I followed. As we delved deeper into the forgotten depths of the facility following Mark who seemed unable to quell his curiosity, it felt as though we were descending further into the depths of a nightmare. The echoes of our footsteps reverberated through the labyrinth, bouncing off of the cold, sterile walls. Yet it was the other, unexplicable, unexplained noises that had me jumping at shadows. Each room we stumbled upon seemed to house more disquieting remnants of the bunker's history. The signs of chaos were clear to see. Lab benches upturned, shattered glassware, discarded lab coats that appeared to have been torn off in a panic. A chilling story was beginning to form filling in the blanks that the scientists' recordings had left. Mark, ever inquisitive, found more recordings which he continued to play. The frail voice of the scientist weaved a tale of dreadful mutations, of grotesque transformations, and powers that defied natural law. Each word, each confession, filled the room the horror of the tale infecting the very air we breathed unleashed an uncontrollable force. Mark murmured, repeating the scientist's words with a chuckle, still somehow convinced that this was all a joke. Tom's face was ashen as he whispered, What were they doing here? I looked at Tom, a grim realization dawning. Whatever it was... I have a feeling that it didn't end well. As we listened, a new truth unveiled itself. A truth about the birth of chaos. The havoc unleashed by the very minds who sought to control it. The scent of fear was thick in the air, permeating the walls, the floors, the silence. A haunting testament to the unseen terror that had once unfolded. It was like a surreal dream. The reality of our situation too absurd, too horrifying to fully digest. As I looked around the room, catching the shivers creeping into Tom and even Mark's face, I realized the gravity of what we were discovering. This wasn't a random, abandoned facility. It was a crypt that hid its dead along with their twisted histories. As we had listened to the tape, the sounds that had been occurring occasionally had begun to happen with what now seemed an alarming regularity. A creeping realization that pricked at the back of my neck, making the hairs stand on end. Once again, I realized that we truly weren't alone in here. And now, it was undeniable even to Mark. The noises had become an echoing drone that sounded too much like a low growl. The scuttle that echoed metallically down the corridors, the unplaceable sounds that seemed to come from the walls themselves, they weren't figments of our fearful imaginations. They were real, they were close, and they were born out of the same darkness that we were now unraveling. Tom reached down into a pile of debris and pulled out a piece of rebar. He grasped it in his hand, preparing to use it against whatever might come out of the darkness. 
An icy shiver traced down my spine. I felt like there were eyes on us, a presence lurking in the shadowy depths of the bunker. What is that? Tom whispered, his eyes wide as he glanced down the dimly lit corridor where the strange noise had echoed. I don't know. Mark responded. There was suddenly a tremor in his voice that mirrored my own dread. As we looked around us, I had a horrible realization. In our attempts to keep up with Mark, I had lost track of exactly the way we had come. Do you guys know the way out? I asked. Tom and Mark looked at each other. No, they said in unison. We were lost in the heart of a forgotten nightmare, trapped in the belly of a monstrous secret. The true depth of the horrors that awaited us in the abyss was something we were yet to discover. We began trying to recall the way we had come, attempting to retrace our steps. But the facility was vast and we had been careless. What seemed like hours passed. We were completely lost. The noises continued, now closer. There were moments when I could have sworn that I saw something out of the corner of my eye, lurking in the shadows. But when I turned, there was always nothing there. The reality of our situation began to seep into our bones. The excitement of our initial discovery had worn off, replaced by an eerie dread that clung to us as surely as the damp chill of the bunker. We were hopelessly lost and likely not alone. Each echo in the distance set our hearts racing. Each movement glimpsed in the corner of our eyes reduced us to paranoid whispers. Did distorted remnants of the failed experiments, grotesque and unknowable, lurk unseen in the shadows of the maze-like facility? Or was it just our imaginations? Either way, we were in serious trouble. Did you hear that? Tom's voice shattered the silence. It reverberated against the cold concrete walls. It's, it, it's like, it's like something's moving, he said. His words drifted, a question left unanswered. Mark and I exchanged wary glances the fear evident in both of our eyes. I could hear it too, a scratching sound resonating from deep within the labyrinth of corroded hallways. It floated above the other noises, an unsettling melody of our nightmares. We stumbled forward into old labs, their pristine white tiles now stained with the aged patina of dust and dried blood. Broken equipment and overturned tables spoke of a frantic struggle, a testament to the havoc wreaked by the unleashed abominations. An odd, visceral dread coursed through my veins, a primal instinct screaming that we had to get out of here. But we were lost in the echoing maze of darkened corridors and buried secrets. Every sound, the distant drip of water, the squeak of our boots against the cold concrete, the echo of our labored breathing, was a potential harbinger of danger. Yet in the cavernous depths of the facility, a greater horror awaited us. A terrifying truth that would bring us face to face with the remnants of the facility's disastrous experiments. We moved steadily onward. Every turn revealed more of the bunker's sinister past. Mark led the way, his stern face illuminated by the faint glow of his flashlight. His determination had now become a beacon guiding us through the sea of our despair. A silent reassurance that pushed us forward. He navigated the facility with a grim resolve. His eyes scanned constantly for anything familiar that might help us find our way back to the exit. Multiple times we realized we had circled back on ourselves, 
Navigating this place is like a waking nightmare, Mark murmured, his voice barely above a whisper. With each passing minute, the labyrinth of the facility seemed to shift and morph, like it was a living entity breathing in the dark. It felt as though the bunker itself was alive, its shadowy corridors shifting to lock us in with the horrors that it had bred. Hold on, Mark gestured, his hand halting us in our tracks. He pointed to a door on our right with three deep grooves carved into it. I remember that. I thought it was part of the prank, you know, claw marks. Yeah, the prank, I muttered. I looked at Tom, his face illuminated by the faint beam of our flashlight. Fear was etched deep in his eyes, but there was a hardened resolve too, a determination that spoke of his will to survive. We cautiously approached the door. We entered the room and found a recorder on a desk. Mark pressed rewind and the tape spun backwards. He stopped it and then pressed play. The voice from the first recording echoed through the room. Okay, so we're close to the entrance then, I said. Yeah, I think, I, I think we came in from the far end of the hall, Mark said. We went back into the hall and headed towards the far end. As I looked at the debris on the ground, I saw things that seemed familiar. It seemed that we were on the right track now. The acrid scent of decay and something unspeakably foul hung in the cold metallic air. The remnants of horrors long past yet ever present. The scent seemed to have grown since we came in. We moved as shadows, our steps echoing through the lifeless corridors, bouncing off the decrepit walls that seemed to close in around us. The noises had died down a bit, quite a bit, which was relieving. Did you guys see that? Tom's voice echoed through the corridor, shaky and uncertain. I turned to where his flashlight was fixated. There, imprinted on the thick layer of dust on the floor, was a fresh trail of something. Something best described as viscera. Some sort of blood, but not human. Not quite. We moved past it and continued towards the exit. The echoes of our footfalls gave way to a deafening silence as we approached the rusted steel door of the bunker's entrance. Our flashlight beams caught the dust particles hanging in the air, creating a hazy, ghostly effect that added to the eerie ambiance. Before us lay the entrance room. The frigid air smelled of decay and abandonment, of things better left untouched. How I wished we had. The abhorrent memory of what this facility had been, what it had become, clung to us like a death shroud. Finally, Mark's voice broke through the quiet, a whisper in the abyss. His eyes were wide, frantic in the dim light. Tom nodded, his fingers tightening around a piece of rebar. My heart hammered in my chest, each beat a silent plea for salvation. Suddenly, from behind us, there was a vicious roar. And from the inky shadows to either side, the twisted remnants of what was once humanity emerged. Their grotesque forms painted in stark relief by our wavering flashlights. The abominations before us, once men, subjected to the inhuman trials of this forgotten research facility, bore down upon us. Get back! Tom cried, stepping forward as a creature lunged towards us. He swung his makeshift weapon with a primal roar. The creature, a distorted echo of its former self, fell back with a guttural hiss. There was a visceral satisfaction in watching it recoil, a sense of triumph in the face of our terror. Yet it was short-lived. Mark and I followed his lead, pressing our backs together as we faced the monstrous opposition. 
The underground corridor echoed with a symphony of monstrous growls, the scuffling of desperate feet, and the metallic clang of Tom's rebar connecting with the grotesque flesh of our pursuers. We need to get out now, I yelled, my voice rising above the chaos. I pointed towards the entrance hatch, its outline faintly visible in the harsh flashlight glow. Go! As if in response to my desperate command, a creature lunged from the shadows, cutting off our path. Its distorted features bore no semblance to the man that it must have once been. The shadows danced over its grotesque form, amplifying the horrific mutations wrought by the facility's experiments. Tom was the first to react, letting out a battle cry that seemed to shake the very walls of the bunker. He charged, his rebar weapon raised high. The creature barely had time to react as he crashed into it. His determined yell cut abruptly short when he was consumed by the monstrous form. Mark and I watched in horror, frozen in place for a moment by the dreadful spectacle. Tom! Mark's anguished shout echoed in the stark corridors. But there was no time to mourn. No time to do anything but run. We turned towards the entrance, the grim memory of Tom's sacrifice propelling us forward. We broke through the main door and up the stairs, then clambered up the metal rungs of the ladder leading to the surface, each step a prayer for deliverance. I made my way up and pulled myself out, turning around. I saw Mark was right behind me. Then I heard the guttural sounds of the creatures echo from below. I reached down into the hole to try to help Mark up. Our eyes met and he reached up for me. Then the unthinkable happened. As he was reaching out, a monstrous hand came from the darkness, grabbing him around his ankle and pulled him back into the darkness. His screams tore through the silence a haunting echo of the nightmare we were living. I watched in horror, helpless as my best friend was dragged back into the abyss. His screams echoed up from the blackness. Run! Go! 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 Summoning the last of my strength, I slammed the hatch shut, sealing the monstrous creatures and the echoes of my friend's final moments in the eerie darkness. After a few moments of silence, I could hear grating sounds as the beast pressed against the steel door. It echoed in my ears as I staggered away from the sight. My muscles screamed in protest with every step, but I urged them on, driven by a primal instinct to survive. Every beat of my heart was a reminder of the horrors that I had left behind and of the friends that I had lost. In a daze, I found myself back at the campsite, its normalcy a stark contrast to the nightmare that lay beneath the earth. I felt like an intruder, an alien creature thrown into a reality that had ceased to make sense. My friend's belongings still lay strewn about. Tom's trusty old guitar, Mark's battered camping mug, their laughter and camaraderie, a cruel echo in my mind. I need to get help, I muttered to myself, my voice barely audible. I headed down the trail back towards the car. By the time I reached it, the sun had been down for a while. I drove to the nearest town and arriving at the police station, I told them everything, stumbling over my words as I narrated the horrors that we had encountered. The officers' faces were etched with disbelief as they listened, their skepticism growing with each passing minute. Despite their obvious doubts, they agreed to visit the site, if only to calm a citizen's apparent hysteria, and to find out what had happened to my friends. As we arrived at the parking lot, we were met by a wall of military vehicles, a barricade had been erected across the trailhead. There were soldiers everywhere, all heavily armed. 
We parked and the police officers got out and approached them. I sat in the car watching as they had a conversation. After what felt like an eternity, they returned to the patrol car, their faces pale and grave. Let's go. One of them muttered, avoiding my gaze as he started the car. As we drove back, we were abruptly stopped by a black SUV. Four men stepped out, their faces hidden behind the dark tint of their sunglasses. They approached the car and gestured for the windows to be rolled down. You. The one in front gestured towards me. His tone was frosty. You didn't see anything. In fact, none of this happened. But I... I started to protest, only to be cut off by his icy stare. Your friends were attacked by a bear. A tragic accident. But that's all it was. Nothing more. He intoned, his voice devoid of all emotion. The absurdity of their story and the stark contrast to the grim reality that I had experienced sent a shudder through me. I wanted to fight with them and argue to demand justice for my friends, but the cold reality of their authority and the threat that seemed to hang in the air, it forced me to be silent. After all, who would have believed me anyway? And so, the bear story was told and accepted, swallowed by my friends and Mark and Tom's relatives. The truth remained buried, just as the bunker was, hidden beneath layers of dirt and bureaucracy. My memory of my friends, of Tom's sacrifice, was the only record of what had actually happened. I tried to forget it, but the truth has a way of gnawing at your soul, of not letting you rest until it's told. So, last week, I returned to the forest, to the exact spot where the entrance had been. The hatch, the steel door, all traces of the bunker were gone, replaced by an untouched expanse of earth, but I knew better. Beneath that innocent facade lay a labyrinth of dark secrets and forgotten horrors. The story needed to be told, and as the only survivor, as the only witness, it fell to me to be the bearer of this grim truth. The terror of the facility may have been erased from the world's sight. The experiments conducted there may be known to no one. But still, it remained etched into the very fiber of my being. The last vestiges of my friends, of Mark and Tom, their echoes, their courage, their ultimate sacrifice needed to be remembered. And so, I'm telling the story, our story, though the world may not believe it. But it should, nevertheless be known.